get back into whatever you locked. All right. Uh, Aga, are you guys going to go? Yes. You are. Okay. All right. Before Chase, before you go, we have the raffle for those of you who took an extra opportunity to connect with different missions reps last Thursday on campus. You not only did our little, uh, our little punch card, but then you also took time to go back and had longer conversations. You were entered into a raffle that has, what is the prize? Gift cards. Gift cards. Oh, we got multiple. There's an S at the end of that. Everybody say, gift cards. Gift cards. All right, are you excited? Starbucks. Dave's Hot Chicken. Woo! Dutch Bros. Nectar. Dairy Queen. Okay, do they get a choice or are you going to like do which one? Oh, they get a choice. Yeah. So win early and often. There you go. And the first winner is? First winner is Taylor Kenworthy. <laughs> yeah. Someone named Taylor just went, oh, it's me. Oh, it's not me. Wrong Taylor. Okay. All right. If you're here, come on up. Anyone here? Is... Not here? All right. You got to make a decision. Is it still available for them later on? Okay. Okay. They'll, they'll have whatever's left over. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next. Let's go. Drum roll, please. Yeah. William Callahan. Where's he at? Where's he at? There he is. He's coming on up. Yeah. All right, do you know which one you want? What are you going to choose? There's hot chicken, Dutch bros, nectar smoothies, DQ, or Starbucks. Dave's hot chicken. Dave's hot chicken. There you go. Dave's hot chicken is... Yeah is off the list now. All right, let's go. Next, Jasmine Roberts. Jasmine, are you here? Hey, all right, Jasmine, come on up. She's deciding right now, yeah. She's deciding right now exactly which card she's gonna choose from. Dave's Hot Chicken is off the list. So, all right, which one do you want? There you go, thank you. What'd you take, what'd you take? Derek. Dairy Queen is off the list. Yeah. Haley Wumbo. Haley, come on down. You're the next contestant on Gift Card Central. Come on up. All right, yeah. Go ahead and name the next one then. Next, Isabella Cameron. Yes. Isabella, come on up, Isabella. There's a lucky suction over there, it looks like. Come on up. Which one did you take? Which one did she take? She took Dutch Bros. All right, Dutch Bros is off the list. All right. Well, Isabella, you have two choices. There you go. Okay. All right. And then that means Taylor gets, Taylor gets, nectar. gets nectar. Okay, there you go. All right, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Awesome. All right, and we have a slide. Janie, if you have that slide for the capstone, there it is. And everybody say, hi, Chase. Hi, Chase. Uh, Chase is doing his capstone as a communications uh, major, and we sometimes allow that to happen in a context for our chapel, and he's going to talk about what his capstone is about. Uh, I mentioned last week uh, the importance of empathetic listening, and I want to also reiterate that uh, this week as well. Um, I want you guys just for a second to imagine uh, somebody in your life that's older than you, um, and they just seem to have everything together. I know that's probably something, somebody specific in your life. They seem very, you know, sure of themselves and whatever that capacity is. Every decision they make seems to be, you know, more intentional, more aware of just everything they're doing. Um, and um, you can basically help yourself and others get into that point in life through empathetic listening. And it's research backed, it's true. Um, there's just a way nowadays where we um, are just maturing at a slower rate, um, just in general. And so it's really, really good to see empathetic listening being a huge impact in this capacity for us to all mature faster. Um, and 
I mentioned again last week the tips and tricks I want to mention to you guys as ways in which you guys can be better friends to those around you, and those are as follows. Um, uh, good amounts of eye contact is a huge indicator of this. Um, it's research backed, like I mentioned before. Um, eye contact seems uncomfortable at times. I know phones can also um, be a distraction to us in ways in which that we're very intentional with our friendships. And so you gotta make sure you're using a lot of good eye contact. Nonverbals of immediacy as well. Um, this also has impact with eye contact, but also, um, you know, it's tone of voice, it's, um, you know, correct gestures, body movement, and space as well. If you're like across the room from your friend and they're telling you all these, you know, deep pains in their life, it's a lot harder to be able to be a good friend to them. Um, and then don't solve it. I know it's a lot of struggle with a lot of guys is that you want to just solve everything all the time. Um, and again, you can't solve it. You just want to listen and be a good friend to those around you. And then ask questions a lot of the time. Um, you'll ask either distracting questions, which is a huge uh, factor in which it's, you know, not helping them um, deal with whatever they're dealing with. And so, um, you know, make sure you're asking questions that are helping them remain their train of thought or continue the story. And that goes into invite them to telling a story as well. It's again, research backed. If they're telling a story of kind of what they're going through or things like that, it helps them um, go through this better and then mature faster and help us in this, you know, growing age of uh, adulthood. So thank you. There you go. Thank you, Chase. All right. So this week we've had a chance to hear from our Puerto Rico and our uh, Mexico teams that went and served this last May. And today you're going to get a chance to hear from some of our team that served in Cambodia. One of the reasons why we do this kind of work is that we all have a sense that we want to make a difference in our life difference in the world, that our life actually has some kind of impact. Matter of fact, we use this language all the time. Impact, influence, opportunity, make a difference. Like it's, it's definitely woven into our own sense of meaning in life. Matter of fact, I think over time, if you've had numerous days and maybe even a season of life where you begin to go like, what's the point? That actually causes some kind of disequilibrium in our life, right? If you've just been sitting around and you're like, what's the point, Right? What am I doing? Why am I spending this time? It doesn't seem to make any difference. When our kids were young, we had a chance to go to different like, you know, fun amusement park kind of places. And of course there's the one in Southern California, there's a place called SeaWorld. And I know there's some dodgy conversation around the fact that like what we do with our, our, our animal friends. But at the time we would go to these different shows and you get a chance to learn a little bit about the animals and what they were all about, right? And what I noticed is that, that some of these little arenas or little kind of audience places where you got a chance to see these animals, they had kind of like a sitting kind of like gradation, gradation, right? So if you sat here, you would be able to see things, but if you sat here, you were probably going to get wet because some of the animals splashed. And what I noticed about my kids was that my wife and I were going like, hey, like, where's the painted line to where you're going to get wet? And we backed up like two rows because we didn't want to get wet. But guess what my guys did? They walked that down as close as they could possibly get so they would get completely soaked whatever happened during the thing. And here's my observation. I think all of us actually have a splash zone. Like the way you live your life actually has some kind of splash factor. The question is, what kind of splash factor does it actually have? Are you a person that when people are around you, they walk away feeling sadder, more angry, more critical, maybe a little bit more, you know, disillusioned in life? Or is your splash zone more about encouraging others, helping them up, lifting their spirit, bringing some form of hope or even love and kindness into that splash zone? So the fact is that we all have a splash zone. The question is, what characterizes yours? As beacons, part of our call in the heritage of this university is that we are good news wherever we go. Wherever beacons show up, wherever you show up as a representative of who you are as a person, your family, your closest community, and of this university, the question is, what kind of splash zone do you bring? When you walk into a room, is that good news? Or are people like, eh, it's going to get kind of toxic. 
Everybody say, ouch. What is it? You get to determine that, but I think it would be also a very interesting conversation with those friends closest to you to ask them, how would you characterize my splash zone? I dare you today to ask that question to some of your friends. How would you describe my splash zone? When I show up, what is happening? What is the spirit, the tone, what is going on? So for us, part of the way we can do that is following a, a, it's a call of Jesus into this world. He says, here's the deal. You will have a splash zone. Here's what I think the splash zone is gonna look like. And before we go any further today, I just wanna ask you, take a deep holy breath, fully present here. I've been walking around a couple of our chapels. I've noticed that it's sometimes, it's easy to get distracted in here. And I'm gonna ask for you right now, again, just for the next 45 minutes. Put anything away that beeps or notifies or whatever's going on and just be present here. You're going to get a chance to actually practice on some level what Chase just described. There are students going to be up here sharing about the impact that their experience this last May had on their life being in Cambodia. And I would love for them to hear from you and see from you and experience from you an actual presence of listening and honoring that, respecting that, and cheering them on. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I would love for us to pray this prayer together. Again, I wish I had written it a little bit better, but I think it still has the ideas in it that we want. When we talk about the past, we're asking for God to show us a pathway of redemption and what we need to learn from it. We talk about today, it's a sense of like calling and for the future of what he's preparing us for. And then this present moment, what does he want us to receive here and now in this space, in this actual time? So would you read these words aloud with me in an attitude of prayer? Ready, begin. May I be open today to what you have to show me and redeem from the past. May I be formed today for how you are calling and preparing me for the future. May I be present today to receive what you have for me here and now. Amen. In Acts chapter 1, there is this amazing, and I would just say it's, it was a seismic spiritual earthquake that happened. God shows up. He brings the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to bear upon the world in that moment. Jesus has already been resurrected and he promised that he would send us help for our life. And that help is in the form of the Holy Spirit who can reside in us and give us strength and insight and wisdom, spiritual knowledge that we cannot have all by ourselves. And in the moment, there's this sense of like, what does the Holy Spirit come to do? And part of that is this idea of a splash zone. And listen to how this is described. It says, but you'll receive, the pow- receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, Samaria, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And here's kind of the way this flows. Geography is primarily about the people who live there, not just the physical location. Though, for most of us, we have to move from our physical location to meet people who see things in this world differently than us. And so Jerusalem was home at that time. It was their hometown, basically where they lived. It's kind of what God was doing, the center of kind of like the faith. And so that was the place they started. And we've done the same thing. We do not disassociate from our own community. We don't try to hide on these, what, two or three blocks worth of property. We are here for a purpose. As a matter of fact, this school was planted here for a purpose, not in some remote place where we weren't connected to a city. The nitty and gritty shows up on our campus and just across the street. And that's on purpose. It's our Jerusalem. Judea is kind of like a region. It's kind of like what's going on in our area. So you could say that Pacific Northwest could be part of that. You could even see the West Coast as a part of that. Sometimes I think region also includes for us just simply going across our south or north border. It's what's close by. It's our region. Samaria is oftentimes to those who are marginalized or avoided. That's what was happening in that time. If we hear the story about the Good Samaritan, Jesus is telling the story. And in that story, he's using as the hero of a story, somebody for whom most of the people listening to that story would have marginalized, disdained, didn't think were good, not have good words for, discriminate against. And we sometimes knowingly 
and unknowingly avoid people around us. We actually, and I'll announce this at the end of our chapel today, but we're actually going after some of what I think is our Samaria this year on one of our mission trips. I know you can make the case, it's a broader case for many of people who are marginalized and often discarded and devalued, but there's a specific one in our region that we're going to do. And the last one is ends of the earth. And of course, that's just the further pl- furthest places of need. Sometimes we, use the, we used to use this phrase called, you know, uh, the, the third world countries. And the fact is, is that in the developing world, really two thirds of the world is still in the places of kind of early stages of development, lack of resources, poverty reigns. There is lots of issues of injustice. And so for us, it's really the two thirds of the world that we have available to us in this category. So again, we serve locally in our own community, and then we've gone all around the world in different places. We take those instructions from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, very, very important here. And you can see when we actually are thinking and asking for God's direction around the places we go, that is a part of our prayer, praying right out of that passage of Scripture. So we've had the chance, and today you're going to hear specifically about places like Cambodia, Since I've been here in uh, 2010, our first trip was 2011, we've gone to Cambodia every year apart from obviously uh, the pandemic. And there's reasons why we go to Cambodia that are broader than just the fact that there's need in that place. I actually think that I can make a case for almost any major that you all have that's in this room, that you can use that major to fight issues of injustice and poverty in the world And just one country, which you can do that almost in every single category, is Cambodia. It's not about Cambodia necessarily, but it's about the needs and the ways in which we see what's going on in the world and how we actually have the opportunity to step into that. If you're a business major, microfinance. There's so many places in the world where people are struggling to make more, I mean, barely a dollar a day to live off of. And you can help them by bringing the insight and wisdom of economics to that place. If those of you are in exercise science, places around the world where people are struggling with their mobility and their physical health, and you can go there and become genuinely experts in a place that needs you to bring your expertise. Teaching, ministry, almost any category on our campus you can use in a place where there is great need. And it's not that our country and our area doesn't need you? It does. But just think for a moment, like what the impact, the splash that you can have by going to places where the need is so much greater. So we've had teams go for many years, a faculty and staff who have gone on these trips uh, all over the world, fun times I've had in Cambodia with them. And it's really about the people. There is just some amazing people that I consider not just people I get to see once a year, but people that I consider actual friends now. Like my life has been integrated in such a way that I feel like I am asking for prayer and I'm talking about the things that are going on in my life with people who are not just in this region of the world. They're all over the world. And that is something I would love for each of you to be able to have. So very quickly, I'm just going to give you a quick recap of what the Cambodia trip looks like. We're going to show a video, and then our team's going to come up and share some stories about what they experienced while they were there. So if you're looking at a map of Cambodia, so you can think maybe it's kind of like this shape, there's a big, huge lake right in the middle of the country. We start by flying into the capital city, which is kind of like in the southern part of the country, not completely south, but kind of of middle south. And then we basically do, for your direction, it'd be clockwise. Is that right? Did I do that correctly? Yeah, so it's counterclockwise, clockwise. We go to a city called Bonabong, a city called Siem Reap, and then back down to the capital city of Phnom Penh. In Bonabong, one of the first things we do is we actually go out and serve in rural villages, different places. Like there's people who in, in rural places that do not have many resources. They're living off of the land, some pretty strong places of poverty. And we actually get in these trucks and we actually go to some of the most remote, remote places in that area. And it's part of church planting and those kind of things. And so we're connecting with families and people. And so when they meet together for a church, oftentimes it's a house church and they meet underneath the house because the house is on stilts because of flooding. And it's also the shady and and least hot part of the the place. Then we um, 
we go up to a city called Siem Reap. Siem Reap is kind of like a tourist town. And it actually has, um, in, its, in its vicinity, it has uh, what's called Angkor Wat. It is an ancient temple. It used to be one of the uh, ancient man-made wonders of the world. It's like taking, in some ways, the pyramids of Egypt and dropping them in the, in the jungles of Cambodia. And it's profound. And that's, it, so a lot of people go there for tourism. And so there's lots of issues of poverty and trafficking and the lack of education that's there. So we go work with an organization that's there and it kind of looks like working with kids called Little's Kids Club. And there's some amazing leaders that are actually in this picture that we get a chance to work with, Ratanak and Dari. And, and uh, we don't get to show a lot of pictures of the places we go and the kids we work with because we are protecting the vulnerable. We do not exploit them and we don't show pictures of that. Oftentimes we're showing pictures it's because it's more of a public setting or whatever that is. So you don't get to see a lot of the gritty things that we do. But this is a lot of the staff of the Lotus Kids Club School. And uh, we just got a chance to have a big, huge dinner together. Uh, there is food that we ate there that you would not even be able to identify. It was super fun. And they literally just giggled the entire time because it was a huge, huge deal for them to have this massive buffet to be able to cook food at the table. There's a little, a little uh, you know, stoves and those kind of things and, and cook pots on the table and we just ate food there. And so you could see the faces of some of the leaders because what we wanna do is go be a blessing to those folks. Again, Anchor Wat is there. It's this amazing, amazing place. And we get to see about the, the ancient history of this country as well. Then we move to, back down to Phnom Penh. And in Phnom Penh, we get a chance to see villages and places that are in the urban poor in that city. Millions of people live in that city and we get a chance to work with organizations like Agape International and in Sly Pak, with Rahab's church, and then even a, a place called Cambodian Care School where they are literally taking care of the most vulnerable in that community. They have a foster care program where kids get a chance to come and be at the school in the afternoon because their parents are out working. And if they were in their home, it'd be in danger of them being taken advantage of. We work primarily in the second part of this trip with the issue of human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking. We're working with organizations whose holistic work is to both protect, prevent, rescue, restore, and then empower people who have been caught up in this. It is hard work, but it's hope-filled work. So I want to show a video, and it'll just tell you a little bit about kind of where we went and what we did. And it's a little quick video, and then I'm going to invite the team to come up and uh, grab a chair up here. So. You're the God of this city, you're the King of these people, you're the Lord of this nation, you are, you're the light in this darkness, you're the hope to the hopeless, you're the peace to the restless, you are, there is no one like our God. is no one like our God. The greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city. Greater things have yet to come, and greater things are still to be done in this city.
Am I on? There you go. Cool. Thanks. Sorry, that was me. Um, so Emma's getting a chance to kick us off, and she has kind of a cool story of like how this trip was full circle for her. So, um, so my name is Emma, and I started uh, being interested in going to Cambodia when I was in fifth grade. Um, my mom, Nani Skaggs, is a teacher here, and she invited me to the dessert auction we have every year to fundraise. And from there, I met Troy and um, Chase and understood what uh, the Cambodia trip was all about. And since then, um, I've helped sell bracelets um, and fundraise. Uh, and so last summer, my dream finally came true and my mom and I got to go on the trip together. Um, and this is a photo of um, all the kids coloring masks. Um, my biggest takeaway is just the kids. They live with me every day in my heart. Um, and in particular, the message of how powerful seeing someone and someone's name is. So this little girl sat next to me when we were picking her up for kids club and she started pointing at things and teaching me colors in her language. And there was this language barrier, but the next day when I saw her, I greeted her with her name. And I've never seen a kid lit up so much. And we, she came over and we danced and had a blast and just um, the power of a name and being like, hey, I see you, I acknowledge you, you are worthy and you are powerful. Yeah, Elsie. Okay. Hi, guys. I'm Elsie. Um, I really hate public speaking, and I'm also very indecisive. So when I found out we were sharing a story, I think I was, like, the last person to send in anything of what I was going to share. But um, I'm going to tell you guys about someone that we worked with named Sam, and the story of how God has used him is more important than my shaky voice. So I wrote some bullet points. Just bear with me. Um, that's Sam. He is, um, that's, that's his family. As Pastor Troy told me before, that is probably the least amount of people you'll see on a moto in Cambodia. They just ride around like that all the time, like on the busy streets. It's really cool. Um, yeah, that's Sam. He is someone that we worked with in um, Badambang. And um, yeah, he has this presence when you're with him where you just feel, um, you just feel happy and he just has this calming presence about him. Like you just talk with him and you know everything is gonna be okay. And we spent um, like four or five days working with him, going to the different house churches and um, getting to know him a bit. He um, knows English very well and so we, we talked with him a lot and um, it wasn't until one of the last nights in Badambang that we got to actually hear his story. And it really um, struck me. I think that restoration is um, a really big theme from everybody that we worked with in the trip. And um, Sam's story is really unique. So um, something that if you go on the trip, you'll learn about is that they have a... Um, a deep and tragic history um, of genocide in the the pretty near past. Um, so there's there's a lot of very heavy generational trauma, and people that are Sam's age were directly affected by it. Um, it it took the population there about in half, and Sam was one of the people that got to be. Um, relocated for a while with his brother. They came to the States, um, and as he put it, it, it felt to him like they were basically just dropped off in LA, didn't know anything about the culture, didn't know, um, didn't have community. And so because of that, the community that took um, them in while he was in the States, they found themselves in a gang, and he got um, involved in some crime and ended up in um, prison and while he was in prison that's where he met God and became a Christian and he um, he lived his life in prison 
very well trying to seek God, and um, because of that, he got released early. Um, yeah, and so then Sam said that he tried to find work, but it's really hard to find work when you have a criminal record, especially um, then in the area he was in. So um, he ended up eventually finding a job as a janitor, and he said that that was like his favorite job he's ever had. I've never heard anyone talk about about cleaning with such pride. It was really awesome. And he worked at, at a college as a janitor for years. He um, got married and had some kids. And yeah, life was, life was good from what he said in the US. Um, but then one day he found out that his brother who had still been in prison was sent back to Cambodia. And um, he said that he knew that he was gonna be next. And so he decided to go back to Cambodia and he had to leave everything behind that he had built in the States and return to the place that um, before had so much hurt and so much pain for him. Um, and he had, he had come when he was just a teenager. So yeah, it was a very different experience for him to come back um, to, his, to his home and um, so he got involved working with the organization that we worked with in Badenbong and um, spreading Christ to the youth there and taking care of people, shepherding people. Um, he got remarried and had, had kids, so that's his family in Cambodia there. And um, I asked him, after he shared his story, I asked him what his biggest... Um, piece of advice would be and he he just was silent for a while and um, he didn't even answer me that night because he said that no one had asked him before for any advice which just blew me away because his story he has overcome and dealt with so much more than um, anybody that I've met and yet to some extent he was um, he didn't have the opportunity to share that with people. And so basically his advice summed up was essentially to, um, to serve well where you're at and to do everything to the best that you can where you are. And as great as that advice is, what strikes me is how you can see it through his life and how he served when he was forced to leave his home and how he served in um, steward life in prison and then as a janitor and having to move again and um, restarting his life over multiple times, he still had that foundation in Christ um, and kept seeking to do the best that he could. So everybody that we worked with had some sort of, of story along those lines and um, I think one verse from Isaiah fifty-eight twelve. it says, um, those from among you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will raise up the age old foundations and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. And seeing Sam's life and the work that he's doing there, the fact that he's, he's worked with people that were on opposite sides of, um, of the, the war that took place and seeing how God uses restoration and uses um, extreme trials and trauma to to rebuild um, and yeah restore was just amazing so I wish that Sam could be here to tell his story but <laughs> he's not so yeah yeah that's all Listen. Hi, um, my name is Brooklyn. Um, since we're running out of time, I'm gonna try to make this short. Um, that soccer ball um, was from a camp that I'm a part of and I'm a counselor and I work there called Grove Christian Camp. And I was their missionary for um, one of the middle school winter camps and I talked about Cambodia and what we we're gonna do. And then one thing that I had the kids at that camp do, which is like 10 minutes past Cottage Grove, is when they donated, which they would donate at the snack shack and get like candy for themselves and stuff, they would sign a soccer ball 
which I was going to take to Cambodia to um, give to one of the village churches there. So some of the stuff that was written on it was, happy birthday, you are loved, um, you are pretty cool. Just very basic, positive comments, and it was really cute reading them. Um, and then I brought it um, to Cambodia, and the first church that we went to in Badambang, um was a, it was basically a shack. Like, it was very, um, it was very worn down and um, just what you would think of when you went to a third world country. But the kids there were just so joyful and just amazing. And their youth pastor just had a big, fat smile on his face and was, like, coloring the masks with us. And... Um, I was told that he was starting a soccer team there, so I was like, okay, I'm going to give the ball to them. And then a little bit down the line when we went to um, Phnom Penh, we played soccer with the staff members there. So just like making it a full circle, I felt like soccer really spoke into my life because it was when I felt most connected to the people there because it just brought laughter, it brought fun, it brought pain for some people. <laughs> um, but it was just really enjoyable and a good experience. All right. Uh, one of the people that really stuck out to me um, was a guy by the name of Ratanak. We've mentioned him before about Lotus Kids Club, which is a school that he and his wife um, are, are very much so in charge of um, through AIM as well, which is another organization we work with. And this guy is uh, he's my favorite person. But um, the amount of humor that this guy ensues 